Okay. Are you old enough to remember that? <laughs> it's nice, right? Because when I when I do JavaScript, um, I just do talks at JavaScript conferences. It's like literally you were in diapers when I started programming, kind of thing, right? Because there's a lot of young people, so it's kind of nice that people know what that actually is. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was Windows, uh, I think, uh, 2000. I used to run um, by then. Okay, so I'll give you a quick overview of uh, coroutines, uh, what they are. It's not a deep dive, it kind of gives you a feeling for coroutines. How many of you have played with the coroutines in Kotlin? Okay, so leave. Uh, <laughs> learn anything new here. Um, or wait until I show you some stuff on the Kotlin native. Um, and I'll show you some examples and uh, yeah, away we go. Um, Disclaimer, we, we decided to, we're very cautious, so we decided to call the Kotlin, co, decided to call the Kotlin, I have to say, I didn't sleep last night. Um, we have to call, we, we call the co-routines um, experimental, which essentially everyone interpreted as, oh, don't go near that crap. Um, reality is, no, please go near that and play with it and use it and use it in production. Uh, we really want you to use it in production and because uh, essentially what we're saying with the coroutines is that it's experimental in that we might tweak it and we might make changes to the API based on the feedback that you give us, uh, based on the usage, etc. Kind of like we did during the entire course of the Kotlin release. I mean, if those of you that remember from the M1, quite a few things changed. But what we do also say is that we will provide you with compatibility and an upgrade path. So, as you know, for example, with the asynchronous, uh, with the M milestone releases that we had with Kotlin, we always did this phase of where you, you know, if we make a breaking change, we will release a warning in like, if we make a breaking change in milestone three, we'll release a warning in milestone four, give you an upgrade option, and then in milestone five, that warning will become an error. So it gives you always time to upgrade, okay? And that's the same thing that we would do with, with coroutines if we were to change any of the APIs. So don't take the experimental aspect of it, like, okay, I'll, I'll look at this when it's released. <coughs> you start using it now. And in fact, we are using it ourselves. Okay, so possible solutions to asynchronous programming that you're all familiar with, threading. How many of you love threading? Okay. Um, why? Threading is awesome. Um, callbacks, uh, there we go, here we go. Callbacks, right? Callbacks JavaScript, yes? Tilted Christmas tree, you know, 600 levels down of curly braces, love that, beautiful, right? Um, of course, uh, what, um, JavaScript did it said I'll take the futures and all of those things that ha Java have and I'll bring it and I'll call it promises and then sometime someone uh, in JavaScript community said well I don't like the term promises because it's too much commitment so I'll call it maybes um, and that, that's how the JavaScript community goes right um, by the way any, anyone from the JavaScript community here I was insulted and then I ask right um, futures you know about futures in in the JVM system and all of that and of course, there's other ways of doing it. For instance, in the in the C sharp world, we have a sync await, etc. And then, of course, reactive extensions, which are actually very cool, right? How many of you do Rx Rx Java? Right? You like it? No? Okay. Um, but you do have to change a little bit your mindset of how you program, right? You have to think in terms of streams, etc. So threading. What's wrong with threading? Well, here's a simple example of code. I have a post item where I like prepare some um, post here, and then I do a submit post, which requires that to requires information from the prepare post to be able to submit post and then I process the post. And the problem is that this is sequential and then the prepare post is gonna go off in a thread and it's gonna block, block the, the UI or whatever I have and I have to manage that thread. Threads also have a bunch of other issues in that they're expensive, right? The context switches on threads are quite expensive. The threads are not, um, like you can't have a single thread, uh, targets, the threads are not desirable in the state that you have, you know, you have state mutations and there's UI threads and things that you have to deal with. And this is something that coroutines will not entirely take away, but we try and make it somewhat uh, easier to deal with. Then we have the idea of callbacks, right? So callbacks is very simple and it's quite an elegant solution. Callbacks is actually nice. And when you start with JavaScript, it is very nice to do the callbacks. The problem with callbacks is that it is not just a single callback. 
That's where the main issue with callbacks comes, right? Where I have, for example, here I have a prepare post to sync, and then I take a lambda expression that is going to handle that, and then, but that in turn is also an asynchronous call, which in turn needs to be handled by something else, and so on and so forth. And you end up with this, as they say, the tilted Christmas tree of going all sideways with all of the different indentations of code, uh, of the callbacks, right? So you have the error handling can be complicated. You also have, as I said, the callback hell or the Christmas tree. Then there's futures promises and uh, Rx, right? Now this is nice and Rx, and I'm a big fan of Rx and I've used Rx and I've done talks on Rx and Rx is nice in that it provides you with a more fluid way of doing asynchronous programming, right? I get some result and then I'll process that result and then I'll, you know, pass it into here and there. The problem with Rx occurs, of course, is that certain scenarios where you're trying to do multiple things or trying to in introduce an as a synchronous call in certain places does lead to certain issues, right? And, and it also leads to the problem of having to have multiple mindsets, right? If you're not familiar with Rx, it kind of follows that uh, idea with the same as the promises and uh, futures, right? So error handling, again with Rx, you have to handle it on each call because you have to pass you know, the next, the uh, resume, the, uh, the error. You have to think differently a little bit. Now, one of the benefits of Rx is that it's kind of become cross-platform in the sense that, you know, initially Rx came out of C Sharp, it was called Reactive Extensions, and then Netflix adopted it with Rx Java, and then, you know, there's RxJS and there's Rx everything. There is pr pretty much Rx for every um, language platform that you like. So you do get that benefit of a homogeneous way of programming independently of the platform that you're using. But it does change the way that you think from sync to sync, right? You do, it, it does require a mind shift. So now when I'm in the synchronous world, I have to think in one way. When I'm in the asynchronous world, if I'm using Rx Java, I have to think another way. If I'm in the synchronous world using futures, I have to think of a different way, etc. So obviously we wanted to provide an asynchronous model as well uh, in Kotlin and we from the very early on, we decided to do it in a way that does not restrict the developer, right? Very much in line with Kotlin, the, the language itself. If you think about many of the things that are in Kotlin, you, we don't have many keywords in the language. Most of the things that you see are provided as library calls. So we try to give people that flexibility. And Essentially what Kotlin does is implement coroutines and then on top of that build a series of functionality, okay? So the coroutines example here, you can see that essentially I have uh, the same kind of synchronous call uh, that, that we saw in the first one. The only difference is a couple of things. First of all, if you look at the prepare post, the actual call that's going to take some time, it has the exact same signature as a usual call, okay? The only difference is that it has this suspending function at the beginning, and we'll see what that is. Now, if you look at the way I'm using this, again, it's more or less the same. The only thing is that I have this launch thing over here, which we'll talk about later. But I do the sequential steps, right? I prepare the post, I submit the post, and I process the post. So in all practical effects, this is looking exactly like the first synchronous solution. And, you know, as far as we're concerned, this could actually be a thread. But it's something that you don't need to worry about, and it's not a thread. It's a very, very lightweight thread. Okay? The only difference is that I have this launch over here, and I have this suspend over here. Right? Everything else is the same. And when I program, I program thinking in a synchronous way, so to speak. I don't have to have this mind shift, mind, mind shift. Keep, yeah, I keep saying that word. Um, mind shift from, you know, asynchronous to synchronous and keep switching back and forth. <coughs> so I have, I think the same way, and it's the same way of doing things. I have the same API calls when I want to do mapping, filtering, searching, working with lists, collections, all of these things. The same constructs that I have in any language if I'm using uh, the synchronous model. And as I said, you can think of coroutines as lightweight threads. They're actually not something that is required 
by the OS level. So it's not something that the VM or the OS provides. It's, it's basically uh, compiler trickery, so to speak, that is handling this. And we'll see how it's done under the covers. And it's a concept that has existed for a very, 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 very long time, right? This is really not new to Kotlin. Um, we're just providing an implementation of it, similar to Go coroutines. Um, so it's not something revolutionary, you know, it's not revolutionary like um, functional programming is. And I say that with a very sarcastic voice. Right? I, people actually believe that. Right? They, they think that functional programming was invented by JavaScript. Um, so how does it work? Well, under the covers, it's essentially doing kind of like a callback using this concept of continuation. The idea is, is, is essentially the concept around suspendable computation. So I do something and then I have a suspension point where my computation in that point is suspended and then at some point it is continued. And under the covers, the compiler is keeping track of a state machine to know when to bring things back and forth. And it can bring it back forth on the same thread, it can take it on a different thread, etc. But the threading, all of these things, is something that is now transparent to us, we don't need to worry about. The continuation is nothing more than a, a, an interface, right? Which is very similar if you're familiar with RxJava, it's very similar, right? RxJava has three methods. This one has the context, it has the resume, and the resume with exception. Okay? So how does it work? Well, under the covers, what the compiler does is essentially create a state machine of saying, this is my suspension point, I'm going to call something, and then it just basically creates a state for each uh, possible state, uh, a switch statement for each possible state, and then it knows how to come back and forth out of those suspension points and where to continue. Right? Again, something completely transparent to us as end developers. In Kotlin, we have to work with coroutines, we ship them as part of a library which is called Kotlin X uh, coroutines. It doesn't come right now as part of the standard library. Um, and there's a, three main constructs that you have. You have the builders, which essentially allow you to go from the regular world, meaning the synchronous world, to the coroutine world. So things like launch, run blocking, async. Suspending functions, or the suspend uh, keyword, which is allowing you to go from coroutine to coroutine. And then suspend coroutine, which is coming from coroutine back to call back to synchronous. Now, the only actual keyword that you'll notice, um, and in the initial implementations of this, we had two keywords. One of them was called suspend, the other one was called coroutine. Right now, there's only one keyword that's been added to the language, which is suspend. Everything else, all of these constructs, are basically part of the library coroutines, colinx.coroutines. Okay? So nothing is ingrained in stone. It's all basically library calls. And we're providing you with certain implementations, certain constructs that make it easy for you to use. Um, you obviously don't need to use them. You can just create your own um, suspendable points and just work directly with um, suspend functions or just use some of the library functions that we provide you, okay? And the motivation for it, of course, is for any time-consuming operation, right? Because that's what we hate, okay? So, any questions so far? No. Fantastic. Let's move on to anything. Yes? Assuming you're using, say, RxJava in a project, do you get any advantage from using coroutines as well? Um, that's a good question. One which I won't answer. Next. <laughs> so, no. Um, so, the question is, you know, what is the advantage of using coroutines in an existing project? Um, I will give you my answer. Right? My answer is the same that I give to everything. If you don't see any business value in it, there's no reason to switch to anything. Okay? What does coroutines provide you over Rx? It provides you with the same uh, mental model to program, right? with synchronous versus asynchronous. You can, in fact, even combine it because we have some helpers for coroutines working with Rx. Right? I'll show you that in a minute. So it does provide you with that different model of programming. Would I say to you, go and rip out your application and now switch to um, coroutines? No, I probably wouldn't. Um, would, does it have any kind of difference in performance? That's something that you would need to test, right? But the coroutine stuff is essentially, if I come to uh, over here, like, it's not part of the standard library, Co Kotlin, X, coroutines. So, it's under GitHub Kotlin slash Kotlin X coroutines. Um, 
So Kotlin X is, I don't know if you've ever used Kotlin X, it's just a bunch of different extensions, like we've got Kotlin X HTML, Kotlin X CSS, um, things that are not part of the standard library that we ship as extensions, so to speak. And this is uh, the one for the coroutines, right? And you, have, you actually have versions of this for working with Android, you have versions for working with Rx, you have versions for working UI, all of these different libraries are available that provide you wrappers and utility functions based on the type of application development you're doing. I have to say also that I, I, I don't, he doesn't get enough credit. Like Roman Elizarov. I don't think we're seeing what you're saying. Oh. Okay, well, right. So you see this activity monitor? Google Chrome is showing what you should be seeing. Just pretend it's all cool. Okay. Now you see it. Okay, so this is um, what I was showing you. It's part of the Kotlin Coroutines X. Okay, and this is the library that you basically download. And there's a really, really good guide. Like most of the examples you'll see today are basically from this guide. And and this is this is the this is the man, um, Roman Elizarov. He like he writes the code for the coroutines. He writes the demos. He writes the documentation. I, it's like, I don't. I, I really don't know how he does it all, but um, it, it, it's great stuff. Okay, and there's as I mentioned, there's libraries based on what you're doing. Okay. Okay, so let's start with some examples. Right. By the way, this is the new plugin that I've installed. Um, and it's annoying the hell out of me. Um, it's called Key Promoter X. It's a revamp of Key Promoter. And if you keep using the keyboard, it will prompt you to stop and use the keyboard shortcut. I love it. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not annoying. But sometimes for presentations, I do use the mouse. So don't hold it against me. You know the person that always says, "Don't use the mouse. Use the keyboard." Right. Where was I? Okay. So here I have a long-running process, and it basically sleeps for three thousand, uh, five thousand. Um, milliseconds. So if I run this, you know what's going to happen. It's starting here. It's now going to wait for five seconds, um, which is perfect because he told me to make this session for 45 minutes. So I'm added the milliseconds enough. I was sitting at the back there, like timing and saying, okay, I need 10 seconds here. Um, and then I have the, you know, in process and ending here, right? So what's happening? Obviously, it's starting, it's printing, it's running on the same thread, it's waiting for 5,000 uh, milliseconds, and then it's executing the next step, right? Now, the same thing with coroutines, what we can do here is, is essentially, essentially, it's using this launch and suspendable process, right? So let's run this. And you can see that it's starting here and ending here, and you never saw the in process, right? So that's how fast it is. Um, so the problem, of course, is happening here, right? First of all, I've got this suspend. So this is saying that this is a suspendable competition. This is a suspension point. This is where it can suspend this function and then at some point return to it. So I'm launching this uh, process and this is very similar to what you get with something like rx if you've ever tried rx the first time in a console application it's like wait why didn't my result print out because it started here then it launched this on a different context which for now we'll just refer to as common pool and then it continued the execution here and this thing went off but the execution finished before the two seconds were up so you never saw the in process being printed okay so in order to see that, what I can do is hack it with a while true, right? So now you'll see that I have starting here, ending here, and then in process, and eventually it won't ever end because it's a while true, right? So very top down, right? I'm not doing anything. If, if, if suspendable process had a return result, I would just, you know, invoke, create a variable here that returns the result, and then process work with that variable top-down, um, iterative kind of imperative programming here. Now, there's a different way to do this. Um, I can, of course, also do a sleep here, which is kind of similar. Again, you don't do this in real life 
uh, uh, code. This is just to show you the examples, right? But in this case, the main thread is sleeping for four seconds, so it gives the suspendable process two seconds to be able to complete and then show the result, right? Now, thread is some thread sleep is something that you use inside a thread. We have the equivalent inside a coroutine, which is called a delay. So normally, if you want to delay in a coroutine, you use the delay function. Why is that? Because coroutines can also be cancelled, and we'll see that in a moment. And delay copes with the ability to cancel a coroutine. Okay. So here, now notice something else. I've created starting here, I've got the same code, I've just added the delay, right? But I have a new thing over here called run blocking. And run blocking is essentially one of those constructs that I told you about that allows me to go from the synchronous world to the coroutine world, right? And it's essentially saying that run this in a blocking way so until the actual process completes, right? So I can run this and I get the same kind of effect here because I have a delay of four milliseconds and it will again show me the exact same order. What you can do normally you don't do delays or threads or while loops etc. What you do is you normally wait for a coroutine to complete. So when I do launch what launch is actually returning is a job. It's the coroutine job that is being launched right kind of like in the same way that a thread that is being launched, you get an instance of that thread back. So I can get the job back, and then job join is basically saying, join that back to the main thread, okay? So here, it's going to have the same effect, except it's not gonna wait the four seconds to complete. As soon as the coroutine is completed, it's the main thread is gonna basically hold here until it comes back, and then it will join to that. Now, if I don't put this run blocking over here, you can see that this doesn't work, right? Because this is a call that has to be part of a construct that is inside of a suspendable computation. And that's what that run blocking over here does. Run blocking is nothing more than essentially a function that runs a new coroutine and blocks the current thread, right? So this is part of the coroutine uh, Kotlin X dot coroutine library. These are the constructs that you can use to work with coroutines. You don't need to, you can write all of this by hand if you like, but then why would you? Now to, I told you that these are lightweight threads. To give you some comparison, let's show you this. So here I have the same kind of pattern, but instead of using coroutines, I'm using threads. So I have one to 100,000, is that 100,000 yet? 100,000 jobs, that are being going to be launched as threads. And then I'm going to do a thread sleep on each one for one second. I'm going to print a dot out and I'm going to wait for all of it to finish with a, uh, essentially print them all out with the jobs for each, okay? And let's run this. And you can see that I get something printed out, but I don't get the 100,000 printed out. What I do get is unable to create new native thread. Right, because you can't create a hundred thousand threads, you just can't. Well, you can, but you need a lot of power. Now, let's do the exact same thing with coroutines. So, here I have the same kind of setup I have a hundred thousand coroutines, I'm launching them, I'm waiting one second, and then I'm printing the result. Okay, so let's run this. and done. Okay, so they are lightweight threads. Okay, so essentially it is just suspending the computation for each one and each one is taking one second, it's doing it concurrently and it's coming back as fast as possible. Okay, any questions? No, are you following me? Am I awake? Are you awake? Okay, so you could do other things, right? Um, this is just like a tour whirlwind of the different APIs that the uh, coroutines offer you, right? So I can work with jobs, as I said, I can cancel jobs, etc. Now notice something here, and I, in fact, you can see it in this one. So here I, I keep using run blocking, right? Run blocking, uh, here I'm using run blocking. In this one, run blocking, I've had to explicitly add unit. Right? Why is that? 
Because if I don't, it's going to give me an error. Right? It says conflicting overloads. Why? Because this is a lambda expression. And as you know, the last expression in a lambda in Kotlin is the return value. Right? And job cancel is going to return a boolean. Okay? So main, pa uh, main, uh, the main uh, uh, function in Kotlin is not expecting a boolean, it's expecting a unit. Right? So that's why I have to explicitly say that this is a run blocking of unit. So if you get that error when you start playing with this, that's because you have to explicitly say that this is run blocking of unit. Okay? So here I'm doing a launch. Again, for a long running process, I delay 4000 and I can actually, since I get an instance back of that job, I can cancel that job. Now notice that the job is going to take 10 seconds. So effectively, this should be able to cancel after four seconds, right? So if we run this, see that it didn't wait the 10 seconds, it essentially canceled, right? So you have the ability to actually cancel any coroutines that you're launching. Now, in order to be able to do that, you need to be able, you need to essentially um, follow a certain pattern and check it very similar to Rx, you have to check for a specific flag, right? So here it wouldn't be canceling on time because all I'm doing is doing just a while true inside this uh, code routine and I'm not checking to see if there has been a request to cancel my actual code routine. In order to do that, what you do is you use this property that the code routine has, which is called is active, right? So you would check to see if the coroutine is active. Is active is a boolean that will be set to false if the coroutine has been canceled. So that's a pattern that you have to follow in order to be able to have cancelable uh, coroutines. But they are, as mentioned, like the example here is showing you that you can actually cancel coroutines. You can also time out coroutines. So here, for instance, I can say time out after X amount of time. Right now, this one is a little bit. Uh, actually, I was talking to Raman about this because he might change the API a little bit so that you can pass in also the uh, context, which is the thread pool that it's running on. Um, but you you usually do the with timeout as part of uh, an existing code routine. But effectively, this is kind of similar to Rx calls that you say you know retry x times or timeout after x amount of. Um, milliseconds, you can do the similar thing with uh, coroutines. Okay, now in, in C sharp, if you've ever done C sharp, asynchronous programming is done with a sync await, right? We don't have a sync await yet, and I'm not showing you that. So take a look at this example here. Here I have um, measure time in milliseconds, which is basically a standard library called which allows you to measure time when you're working with Kotlin. And I say uh, val1 function1 value of function two and then print the result and then print the total time right function one is a simple function that delays for a second and returns 15 function two is another one that delays one second and returns 27 so if we run this it's going to run result 42 and it's going to take just over two seconds right? what is that saying to us Running yes, sequential, yeah. right? And by default, it's going to write, run sequentially. Now, with you can run uh, coroutines asynchronously, right? Using this sync keyword. Okay, so it's kind of similar to C sharp. Similar, I say a sync the thread pool function, a sync, thread pool, function, and then on the result, I call await. So if you're familiar with C-sharp, it's, 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 it's sort of the, the same thing, right? So if I run this, it's going to complete in one second, okay? Now, you can also pass in a parameter to this in that you say run asynchronously, but lazily meaning that only run when I call await, when, my res when, when I actually need the result. 
So if you run this, what do you think you're going to get? One or two seconds? Quickly. Two. Because it's only going to call two await after one await finishes, right? It's the lazy evaluation there. Okay? So you can actually pass in a second parameter. Now, so far we've been using common pool, but there are other dispatchers, right? So common pool is kind of, again, equivalent to the Rx version of just take a thread pool, take a, a th create a, on the common pool of threads, and then, you know, the, the code routine will take care of making sure it goes back to wherever it needs to go. Um, unconfined means don't have any kind of uh, affinity with a thread, right? Then you have your own custom threaded context. Right, so you can say, I want all my coroutines to always be on the same custom thread. Okay. This is, if again, familiar with RxJava, you can do the subscribe on, the publish on, and pass in the different types of uh, thread pools that you want to work with. Okay. And there's also the coroutine context, which means in the context of the current coroutine, but this, isn't, this is giving an issue because of Gradle versioning. We all love Gradle versioning. Okay. There's also the concept of channels that we have. And channel essentially is a way for two coroutines to communicate with each other, right? So I have one coroutine here and I have another coroutine here and then I can do a send in one and I can do a receive in another and send information back and forth through these coroutines, okay? So here I have a launch pool and I, I'm basically doing a 4x, so it's one to five, channel send, the number, um, squared and then I'm repeating this and I'm receiving the number squared. There is no buffering here. It is basically on a as uh, sent as received um, base. You can pass in a parameter also to say have X amount of buffer. So as a second parameter you could say you know create a buffer on, in the channel. I can pass in a parameter that says what's the buffer capacity and then create a pre-established buffer. Closing channels, like with everything, you can also close channels to say stop sending. For instance, if one channel is always sending, the other one can close. And then we also have a kind of like an abstract layer of the concept of continuous sending and receiving, kind of going the direction of uh, observables with Rx, right? That I have the streams that I continuously am spitting out information from one coroutine and I'm constantly consuming it from another. So we call those pipelines um, well, this is the hand-rolled version, so here I have produce squares, which essentially is just producing a bunch of squares, and then the other one is consuming a bunch of squares, and we have that concept really in what we call pipelines, so you can do this directly using some more abstract function calls, which are creating pipelines for you to send and receive from one coroutine to another continuously. When it comes to... Uh, before I say shared state, one other thing is the next level is actors. If you're familiar with the actor programming model, it's essentially think of the coroutine with the context and the, and the state and the ability to send and receive information, communicate with other uh, coroutines. That, all of that encapsulated is what's called the actor. The Kotlin RX library also has support for actors. And I'm not going to go um, into... Uh, you know, explaining this, but just to give you an idea of the extents of what is available already in the library, including actors. Okay, so you know, you just create the actor class. In this case, it's a it's a function that's creating an actor of type counter message. The counter the actor has its own like object to increment a counter. It has its own methods, etc. And then it's like a self-contained thing that moves around and sends and receives information. Now, one thing that I said the, co uh, the coroutines doesn't entirely solve is the idea of shared state. That's still um, something that you need to do. Uh, one way to do it is to use the single threaded context, create your own counter context, and then just run all your coroutines on that same context, and then you will be able to um, access that state with the affinity to that specific context. Okay? Any questions? Really? Nothing? Yes? If you cancel a job, what's the kind of the state of the job? Is it just as far as it progressed? Yes. There's no kind of rollback or anything transaction? Happens? Currently, no. Okay. Yeah. So it will just be basically until where it left off. Right. 
Um, in terms of error handling, I haven't covered, but error handling basically comes down to the same way you would do it in, in, a synch in synchronous programming, right? It's, it's, it's you know, in, in Rx, you would have to go through the, you know, on error. Um, here is essentially just, you know, try, catch, etc. And all of this, of course, under the cover, as I said, is what it's doing is it's creating this state machine. So the compiler is creating a state machine. It's, it's holding uh, reference to where I can suspend, where I can come back. We don't have, if you're familiar with Scala, there's a concept of implicits. Um, we don't have in implicits in Kotlin except for passing in continuations. So continuations, you don't see them in the signature because they're implicitly passed in. Okay. I don't expect you to follow absolutely everything I said, but I, I wanted to give you a broad idea of where we are with co coroutines, what is possible. And as I said on the um, coroutines, guys, there is actually, let me just find the uh, coroutines. Oh, there's your answer on Stack Overflow. Um, so, you can see that you have coroutines reactive for reactive streams, coroutines reactive for reactor, coroutines Rx for Rx1, coroutines Rx for Rx2, there's coroutines for Android, there's coroutines for WPF, not WPF, for Java uh, FX, there's coroutines for all of the different types of applications that you develop, you have the kind of like API calls to integrate with those types of uh, scenarios, okay? So Rx2 provides you with a whole bunch of, um, uh, you know, API calls to be able to work with Rx and coroutines, okay? So that's, uh, how, f how long did that take? 25 minutes, 30? 45. Really? Oh, cool. Okay. Um, did I tell you that I got a fine? No. Um, so you did. I did. I told the whole world. Um, so yeah, brief overview of coroutines where we are. I would recommend that you start to use them, uh, really, and give us feedback. Uh, when you use them in the IDE, you can see that everything is yellow um, because we like cold play. No. Um, you c oh. Was that a dad joke? <laughs> so, enable coroutine and support module, basically what that will do is get rid of the warning, so you don't have that warning all the time, um, but we, by default, enable it. Um, and, yes, yeah, so, we, you know, based on your feedback, we'll shape it. Uh, I'm, with my colleagues, we're working on a, on a web framework, uh, which is called um, KTOR, K-T-O-R, um, which is kind of like a, Kind of like Spring Boot, not Spring Boot. It's it's more like a, um, a web framework, and um, so we're using co coroutines there. I know that the Vertex uh, Julian from Vertex is already working with coroutines inside Vertex. Um, I believe that the Spring folks are already looking at coroutines with the Reactor and um, Spring Boot. So people are starting to use it. Um, so now is the perfect time to, for you guys to experiment on it and start giving us some feedback. Okay? If no other questions around coroutines, I'll... Yes? Well, I'm just following on from that one. If you do cancel the coroutine, assumably it will actually run to a next stop instance, like a delay for example, will detect stop. Is that right? Or would it just stop at any state? It would stop until it get, basically gets to the is active call. Mm -hmm. And from there it would cancel. Okay, let me show you some Kotlin native. Now, um, how many of you know what Kotlin native is? I'll give you a hint, it's Kotlin native. How many of you have played with it? Right, so Kotlin native is essentially our goal to bring Kotlin to every platform, right? And so far, um, you know, we've, we've, like, one of the things that I've loved about the adoption of uh, Kotlin by the Android community is that obviously it's made a lot of noise and now, you know, um, Google has officially provided support for it, um, which is fantastic, but it also has led to this idea that Kotlin is a language for Android and far from the truth, right? Because it never was our intention. I mean, we don't create Android applications. 
we created Kotlin for ourselves and we create desktop applications and server-side applications and we're actually using Kotlin for these, right? Um, we're right now, the JetBrains account, the Jet Profile, the um, shopping cart, all of these things are written in Kotlin and have been running for years, right? Our desktop applications are now using some parts Kotlin. We're not, you know, we're not a VC that will close shop and rewrite everything in, in Kotlin. So we're just gradually adapting. But it's a multi-purpose language and it always has been and it always will be. And now the next step is to make that multi-platform. So we offer iOS, uh, sorry, uh, right now in Kotlin Native is on the 0 0.3 kind of alpha release, preview release. We have now support for uh, OS X or Mac OS, uh, Windows and Linux, right? We are also going to be bringing support for iOS, okay? So eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to write Kotlin code and target Android and target uh, iOS, okay? So right now, there's no IDE. So I'm going to show you some of my VinFu. I should have done that from root. Um, v, um, hello, dot kt, and then I do fun main args array string print line hello. And now I can just do kn hello. Now kn is a small script that I wrote to basically compile. Kotlin native, and it's, it's essentially, if you look at KN, it's, it's calling the Kotlin compiler with the parameter I'm passing in with .kt and then output the name of the file, right? So I don't have to write this every time. So that, I just ran KN hello, and I got my Kexi, which is a Kotlin XE, which makes absolutely zero sense on Mac OS. But anyway, um, let, let's make this more um, Apple friendly. Now it's Apple friendly. Um, and now I can just do hello and it prints back hello. Okay, so no JVM, nothing. It's running natively on the OS X. So that's it. That's all I got now. <laughs> um, so what, what can you do here? Already you can do quite a bit. So there's, there's C interop, right? So essentially you can interop with C. Um, I've not played with C++ interop and I, I don't know who said it, but the only, uh, you know, nobody can interop with C++, even C++ can't interop with C++. Um, but with C you can interop. And there's a tool which is on the tools, Kotlin native, so on the bin, you see that there is um, the C interop, right? And what C interop basically does is it generates header files for you in Kotlin. So you give it a C library, a C header file, and then it generates the stops for you in Kotlin. And then you just work with those stops, right? So to give you an example of what is possible, I uh, recently decided to do something like this. Uh, Raspberry Pi. So I picked up one of these Raspberry Pi starter kits, right? And I wanted to impress my five-year-old, right? By showing him how I can write Kotlin code and make this LED light up. He's, he wasn't impressed. Um, so the problem here, of course, is that, you know, I can write this code, but to be able to work with this device, you needed to use a library that deals with uh, GPIO, right? And the only GPIO library I found was called PicPO, um, which is, has headers for everything apart from Kotlin, obviously. A lot of people use this for Python. So I thought I'll just give it a shot. Right, so I went to the download site, I downloaded the C library, I ran C interop, it worked. I generated the stop files, I can now write the code um, using uh, this and works really, really smoothly. Um, one of the things that 
as I, as I was saying earlier, I, I, I really, given that I, I, I don't have so much time in my life, I've decided to start a new project, um, which is, I want to create, like, how many of you use Gradle or Maven? Okay. How many of you add dependencies to your Gradle file? And how many of you love going and searching on Maven Central or on JFrog for the actual whatever you need to add and do copy paste and then blah blah blah. You do that, right? You, you enjoy doing that? Yes? Yes? Okay. So what I want to do is uh, something like this. Um, something along the lines of KPM install juice and then that would install juice and all of the configuration to my existing Gradle project, right? But I want to do that without saying to you, what is KPM? And I'll say it's a Kotlin package manager. And you'll say, okay, how do I install it? And you say, we'll use Bower. And you'll ask, what's Bower? And I'll say, it's a package manager. And you say, how do you install it? I'll say, use Brew. And you'll ask, what is Brew? It's a package manager. How do I install it? Use Curl. So um, I want to do that without that. So I thought maybe I'll start to use uh, Kotlin native so that you can just run it on every target. Um, so now I've been playing with it and you can, I've actually, there's a, there's a file, uh, there's a JSON parser um, in C which is called Janssen, which again I've managed to create the C interop and easily just use that file. Um, so it's, it's getting there, it's like it's already people are, are starting to use it um, for, for different things, okay? And then you have the options to do cross compilation. So for instance, in the case of this, this one over here, the, the Raspberry Pi, you know, I need the Raspberry Pi to be able to compile with the files for Raspberry Pi because I'm deploying my EXE, my binary, on the Raspberry Pi. But I don't do development on Raspberry Pi. So you, can ha you have options of the Kotlin compiler to do cross compilation, right? So you can say, you know, compile, I'm running the compiler on OS X, but target Raspberry Pi, and then bring all the libraries from Raspberry Pi and link those in, okay? Um, and it's, it's kind of exciting stuff. And if you want to learn more, there's an awesome event going on. Am I allowed to do publicity? Go for it. Go for it. Um, it's called Kotlin Conf. How many of you going? <coughs> really, only two? It's probably three hundred and ninety-nine dollars. That that is that is actually cheaper than my fine. Three hundred ninety-nine US. Yeah, but it's still cheaper than. Oh yeah, it's no, about okay. <laughs> now that was the only lucky thing that it was Australian dollars. Um, so yeah, so we might show some stuff around Kotlin native there as well. Okay, I'm not saying we will. I'm just saying we might. You, you want to know? You come. You find out. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Yes? Um, if you're doing native stuff, what kind of windowing toolkits are there? Because obviously, windowing stuff for like OSX is very different to Windows, to Linux, and stuff. If you're doing kind of graphical user interfaces, is there a sort of an abstraction, or does it, how does that work? Um, I, I don't think that we've got any specific plans around that right now. I'm guessing that you could probably use something like Qt, okay. which I only found out like about a month ago that it, you pronounce it cute. Not cute it's, I, I always thought it's QT. For like 17 years I thought it's QT, but it's apparently cute. It's spelt QT, but hey, why say QT? We'll call it cute. Um, so yeah, there's, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything planned around that. Um, like, how many of you have uh, used the, the JetBrains Toolbox app? Do you use this? Yeah? yeah? Um, this is actually cute. I mean, it's using the cute language. <laughs> it's, um, it's written uh, using that, but not with Kotlin native yet. Any other questions? Yes? Time frame for, for um, uh, iOS? Any estimates? Oh, I can't tell you that. I'm sorry. Um, well, I'm, I'm not saying that either. Don't, don't put words in my mouth. Right? <laughs> it's like someone tweets, yeah, so iOS is going to be released a Kotlin. I didn't say that. I said, I, honestly, I don't know. And one, one thing that you've probably learned with, with Kotlin um, that we really don't give, like, you know, you, you ask Andre, like, when is it going to be released when it's ready? Which is the, the best agile planning ever, right? Because <laughs> you never go wrong. Um, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, but you know, I can't, I, I really can't. I mean, I can tell you that we're doing, a, uh, we're making good progress, uh, but I can't really say whether it'll be this year or what. You had a question, yes. 
What is the motivation behind Copland Native? Um, because we can't. No. <laughs> um, Just for the job by the JavaScript, I can kind of see because you guys need it yourself internally. Is that also true for Kotlin Native? Um, I, I, I don't think that we needed Kotlin Native, to be completely honest with you, unless there's something I'm not aware of. Uh, but it is, it, it was, you know, I mean, I, I'll, be, I'll be completely honest with you in a, in a sense as well that, like, it was something that we, we wanted to do because we, we were interested in being able to uh, see the potential. I mean, like, we saw a potential of of people using a more modern language moving towards IoT and embedded devices, right? Because right now your choices are pretty much limited, right? It's either C or a little bit C++ and of course you have Android things, etc. as well, but if you wanted really bare metal, um, it was that, right? And we thought, well, why not? And then the opportunity came also to get some folks that um, were really enthusiastic about this and we thought we could put a good team together um, and we, it just kind of all fell into place, right? I mean, the, the, the team right now that um, is working on this, most of them are former uh, Intel developers. They used to work in Intel in Novosibirsk. Um, so the main office for, for Native is now in Novosibirsk in, in Russia. Um, so, you know, and it's something that fortunately right now we can, we can afford and, and we can do it. Um, and then from there on, you know, the our as we've always said like the business model for for kotlin is there is no business model for kotlin as such right we you know we're not we're not expecting to make frameworks and make money off of frameworks or of consulting or of training or anything like that we continue to sell our tools right and we hope that people buy intellij ultimate um so that you know we can continue to develop kotlin I and mean, I say IntelliJ Ultima because you use that for Kotlin, right? But all of the other tools as well. Uh, so right now we can we can work on Kotlin native, and and I you know we're committed to it 100 percent because we do see that in the embedded market and in the IoT there there is a potential for it. Also to give you some insight into numbers, uh, we're right now just over 700 people at JetBrains, uh, the largest team at. It's like really. <laughs> Um, the largest team is the IntelliJ team, which includes the IntelliJ platform and the IntelliJ Ultimate team. I'm not talking about like the PyCharm, the PHP Storms, etc. Um, and that is around 40, 45 people, more or less. The second largest team is Kotlin now. We're around 42, 43 people. Okay. And we're hiring a couple more. So, you know. We need to continue to sell IntelliJ IDEA ultimate license <laughs> and reshop and all of the other things. Yes? How does memory allocation work in Kotlin native? Um, so it's basically going to have a, kind of a similar model to uh, the Swift model. Uh, so, you know, you have reference counting, automatic reference counting, uh, and I think that primarily that's going to be the way. Any other questions? Yes? Excuse me, are you doing anything about the compile time when using interfaces in Android? Are we doing anything about the compile time when using interfaces in Android? Yes, but it takes a lot of more time and memory when we're using interfaces. And Android and Android. Okay. So interfaces are so overrated, they're so 80s. Don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> We are increasing the performance, yes. Uh, like, that's the only thing I can say to you. Day by day, we're working towards making the performance better. And I think that you could probably all attest to that, that it is a fact, right? The performance is improving. We have incremental compilation. We've added it for multiple build tools. And the best thing that you can do in situations like that is to send us a memory snapshot, a, a memory profile within IntelliJ ID or Android Studio because really those cases are the ones that help us pinpoint the issues as well, right? Remember, we don't develop Android applications, especially ones that use a lot of interfaces. So, any other questions? Yes? Um, any work on a GUI tool for Kotlin Native? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, 
I, I can't say it right now. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Uh, well, uh, what I can say is that our business model revolves around tooling. Yeah. Exactly. So. <laughs> And like, and I can also say to you that we believe in tooling, and we want the experience to be great. So you know, right now there's no tooling for native. Like, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions that doesn't put me on the, you know? <laughs> you want to know about my fine? <laughs> Anything else? No?